Okay, so today we're going to look at, at the Java Fundamentals 3.5 slides. I will try to give you a little bit more information and background than what you would get if you just went through these slides yourself. So some of you may want some more information. Um, it probably will take 30, anywhere from 35, about 35 minutes. Um, so let's take a look at that. Um, should be at slide one and we'll move down. Um, so today we'll look at Java Fundamentals 3.5, randomization and constructors. We'll see how those go. Um, I'm going to try to talk quickly in the parts of that. Hopefully you don't need as much information and then I'll slow down when you do need the information. This way maybe it won't take quite so long. Go down to the next. Our objectives. Um, we're going to see how to create randomized behaviors, define comparison operators, create if-else control statements, create an instance of a class, and recognize and describe dot notation. And we'll move to the next slide. Um, so the first thing we're going to take a look at is the get random number method. The get random number method is a static method that returns a random number between zero and a parameter limit. This method is used to eliminate predictability in our program. Um, and here we see the method signature. Notice the method signature gives the accessor, which is public, don't need to worry about accessors right now. Um, just know that's what this is. Um, and for the most part, when we create a method, that's what we're going to put. There are other accessors that we can add. So static means it belongs to the class rather than in, in the instance. Um, and the best way to understand that is when we get the random number, we're going to, we'll see, we're going to use green for get, get random number rather than a specific instance of the green foot class. Um, kind of like when we used Alice and we might say um, child one move, child two move, child three move. Those are all instances of the class. That was a non-static method. Um, here we see int, which is um, the return type. We've also seen void. Void means there is no return. Um, but we're going to return an integer. That integer is going to be a random number. Um, here's the name of the method, get random number, and it's in parentheses. And in the parentheses, we have what is called a parameter. Um, that parameter is going to be an integer, and it's going to be a limit. Um, we'll take a look here. This is how that works. We call Greenfoot. So in the Greenfoot class, we use get random number, and we give it a limit of 20. Um, so as we do that, we're going to see dot notation. Um, dot notation is um, a way that we can access methods in a class that is not inherited from a superclass. Um, so notice new subclasses that we create do not inherit get random numbers. This method must be called from the Greenfoot class using dot notation. Greenfoot is where it is, dot, get random number, and that's going to be 20. Um, we'll see in a moment that 20 is the max limit. It needs to be less than that. So we're really going to get a number 0 to 19. But let's take a quick look at our Greenfoot class. Um, and this is what they mean. If there's something in actor, We'll open up the actor documentation. If we take a look at actor and we look at move, move in distance, we tell our object to move a certain distance. And I'm going to go ahead and add that to um, frog, um, say move one, because that's what it required. Notice move distance, it requires a parameter for the distance. And then if I put this in, and I add the frog, he moves one. Also notice, all I put was the move. Um, but what if I want something to move, what if I want something to move a random amount or turn a random amount? Well, after doesn't have move. And if I, uh, I don't see the scroll bar. There's the scroll bar. I could come here. Greenfoot, get random number, 
and it needs to know a limit. Okay, that's what they are showing us here. Um, green foot, get random number, and the limit. The frog class in my example, or any subclass really, new subclasses, they're not aware of get random number, so we have to say where get random number is. It's in the green foot class. Um, and here they give that explanation again. When you want to use a method, but it is not inherited by the class you're programming, specify the class or object that has the method. Before the method name, then a dot, then the method name. This technique is called dot notation. Um, the dot notation format is just what we looked at. Um, notice this is for a static method or a class method, class name, dot, the method name, and then the parameters. In the, end, in the example we saw, we had green foot, dot, get random number, and then whatever that random number is. Um, we may also have an object name dot the method name and parameters. These are for non-static methods, or we may call those instant methods, instance methods. So um, we haven't seen this, I don't think, in Greenfoot, but if we think back to Alice, we may have said child1 dot um, do something, and then whatever the parameters. And um, so sometimes we needed to tell it the class that's going, where we're getting the method. Sometimes we want the off object that's going to um, perform the method. And here again, we see the dot notation example using green foot dot random number. Remember, it's going to go from zero, but up to, but not including 15. Um, and we'll return, so it will return 0 to 14. We can see that also in the um, Greenfoot API. If we look here, um, a limit is an upper limit, which return the random number will be smaller than. The returned random number will be smaller than. Um, the random number is within 0 to limit minus 1, the range. Another way that they explain it is, it's between zero inclusive, the zero is included, and the limit exclusive, the limit is not. So if we put 20, it's zero to 19. Um, let's get back to our slides. Um, we just looked at the API to see how that works. The API is a good way if you start looking to learn what tools you have in the toolbox. and we can start using these and you be creative on how you use it to get the program to do what you want. Um, they're going to show us the steps to view the methods in the GreenFit class. That is what I just showed you. Um, but we go to help, we look at class documentation, and then we click the GreenFit class. We can review the methods, signatures, and their descriptions. So if we want to um, see what an actor can do. We can click for the actor um, class and the actor methods. So actors, we may want to get neighbors. Later on, we're going to want to determine if the actor is at the edge. Is he at the edge? Is actor at, is at edge? Is that? Um, we've used move. We might want to remove an object using remove touching. Um, we may want to change the image of the actor that image. There's actually two different ones, and it depends on the parameter that we send which one it will use. Uh, haven't learned that yet, not going to worry about it now. We can set a location, which we will do later. Notice if we use set location, it's going to require an X and Y parameter. Set the rotation, the direction that he's facing. Um, that's going to require a single parameter. Um, if we want them to turn um, single parameter. So we see there are different things we can do. Um, actor Greenfoot are the common ones we're going to use. Um, we may also want to use others. Um, you can see World here also. Um, so we'll go back to the slides and see where we are with that. Um, they show us the API. We've already looked at that. Um, so we're going to move on to comparison operators. Um, 
and we'll use the get random number in that comparison operator. And I'm actually going to use that with the world scene that I have set up. Um, but they tell us the comparison operators can be used to compare a randomized value to another value in a control statement. It does not have to always be a randomized value. In this case, it is. Um, it, the example below determines if a random number is less than 20. Notice not less than equal. If it is, the object will turn 10 degrees. How often will this happen? Well, we figure if we go from 0 to 99, less than 100, that we'll get 0 to 19 20% of the time. We could have just as easily used 20 here and say less than 2. That is also 20% of the time. Uh, let's go ahead and program this into Greenfoot. Let me go ahead and make it so I can see both windows at the same time. Uh, I'm going to bring this down so we can see. All right. So let me add a fly. Let me go ahead and we're going to make the fly move um, or turn a random amount. We'll go ahead and open editor. First, I'm going to do add a move in here so the fly actually moves. Then what I'm going to do is, oh, I didn't put my amount. Then what I'm going to do is add my if statement, my conditional statement, green foot. And the spelled number. All right. So he's going to turn 10 degrees. And notice we have our conditional. Um, the condition uh, in between the parentheses. And then here's my code block. We'll go ahead and we'll add a, just add the fly. I'm not worried about the frog just yet. And notice he gets some, some randomness in the amount he turns. But it's a little weird because he doesn't go left and right. We'll take care of that in just a moment. Let's look a little bit more at our slides. Notice comparison operators are symbols that compare two values. And we'll see they're the same that we've seen in math. We've seen less than, greater than, less than equal, greater than equal, equals, and not equals. They give us that all in the chart over here. Um, notice that an equal is a double equal sign. This is our comparison equal. A single equal sign, as you may remember, means a sign to. So we need to make sure we keep that straight, double equal sign. Notice also slightly different than math. Less than equal, greater than equal are actually two different sim two symbols together. And the not equal is an exclamation point and equal. The exclamation point may sometimes be referred to as bang. So bang equal would be not equal. We'll move along. Gaming problem solved with random behavior. The problem of why should move randomly so it is more challenging for a keyboard control object, the B, to catch it. Solution, the fly should turn a small amount as it moves. The code, to code this solution, we want the fly to turn a random number of degrees up to 20, 10% of the time as it moves. Here's the challenging part. It's critical thinking. How do we do that? Um, so if we want it to happen 10% of the time, we need a random number and then it'll execute when this is less than one-tenth of that, which means we could have used 10 and 1, 1,000 and 100. Whatever you want that to be, that will get us the 10% of the time. The turn 20 degrees is um, basically that's our kind of fix. We don't have to worry about changing that. So 0 to 19. Um, but we see they program that. That's what we use. Um, notice they tell us we have the if control statement with a parameter of 100, comparison operator less than, and then that limit, which is 10. And the method body, that's what this is, or method body, we have whatever the statement, is, statement or statements that we want to happen when this meets our criteria. In this case, we'll turn 20 degrees. We've already seen that, and we saw that it was a little awkward um, 
because we always turn the same amount. And in real life, a fly doesn't always turn left. It doesn't always turn right. He will go something random. Um, so we're going to tackle that problem. And we're going to code this. We'll see how it works. And then we'll take a look at why we chose the numbers that we did or what those numbers are actually. We should be able to type. Actually, we'll, instead of this just turn, we're going to turn a random amount, green foot, uh, get random. Okay, so let's see if this looks a little bit more natural. We'll bring the fly in. And notice it looks more natural. Okay, so let's see, why do we choose the numbers we did? Okay, well, we want them to go left and right. Positive numbers will be to the right. Negative numbers will be to the left. So think about this. We can get anywhere from 0 to 89. Well, what if this were 0? Zero? 0, my random number, minus 45 gives me what? Negative 45. That gets me in the negative direction. Well, what if I get 90? 90 minus 45 is 45. It's actually going to let me move up to 44 degrees, right? Because that's almost like if I put that number in here, right? The most I could get, I can't get the 90. I can get an 89. 89 minus 45 would be 44. Um, but we get the idea. I could have changed this to 91 and get me negative 45 to positive 45. But as long as you understand how it's working, then that's great. But as we see, that gives us a little bit more natural movement. So let's go back to our slides over here and bring that back full screen and 100%. And let's go down. So slide 16. Conditional behavior. Instances can be programmed to perform specific behaviors if a condition is not met using an if else statement. For example, if an instance is programmed to turn 6% of the time, what is it going to do the other 94% of the time? An if else statement executes its first code segment if a condition is true, and its second code segment if a condition is false, but not both. The false part will not be read if the true part or the else part will not be read if the um, if part is met. And we'll look at that. Evaluate the condition. True, we go this direction. False, we go this. Notice we're not doing both. Notice we're not doing both. If else format. If condition in the statements, the same way we did before, and then else. Notice else doesn't have a condition. Because here we say, if I make $50 this week, I will go to the movie. Else, I will stay home. We don't need to say, else if I don't make 50, because the fact that we didn't make 50 it means that this is the part that needs to be executed. So, if I don't make 50, if I, if I make $50, do this. If I only have 40, this doesn't get read. It doesn't need to. It knows that this didn't happen, or this wasn't met. It moves all the way down here. Here's our example. Um, I'm not going to program this in, but I do think you should understand how it works because you'll need it for things later. Um, if our random number is less than 7, we'll turn 10. Else, we'll turn 5. Okay, so we didn't use randoms anymore. Um, and I might even do turn 10 or negative 10 or always turn one direction. But we see how the format works. It's basically the same thing as the if, only we're adding an L. Um, so we may want to automate the creation of instances. If you notice, as I was, every time I reset, I need to add instances here. Um, so we can automate the creation of instances. Um, but using the world subclass, actor instances can be programmed to automatically appear in the world when the scenario is initialized. Um, in Greenfoot, the default behavior for instances is as follows. The world subclass instance is automatically added to the environment after compilation or initialize of the scenario. So when I click reset, the frog world automatically loads. Um, an actor subclass, the actor subclass instances must be manually added by the player. 
we need to manually add, in this case, frogs, in this case, flies. Okay, we would need to manually add those. Um, but we don't have to do it that way. Um, we can make it so that these get added also. Um, so if I jump up to 20, um, we'll see. We want to learn how to automate creation of instances in the scenario. Problem when greenfoot scenarios, such as leaves and wombats, or my frog and fly, the started instances must be manually added by the player of the game. The solution, program instances to be automatically added to the world when the scenario is initialized. Basically, initialize is when we compile and run everything. Uh, so they tell us how we're going to do that. But they tell us, to understand how to automate creation of the actor instances, we need to understand how the world class source code is structured. Um, the world class, the world constructor is used to automate creation of actor instances when the scenario is initialized. Um, we don't need to do that. So we see here they're using B world extend world, right? We see the class header, and they give us a comment constructor for objects of the B world, and then we see public B world, which is the constructor. Notice the constructor name is the same as the class name. When we initialize an object of this class, the constructor is automatically executed. When we add a bee, or we add a fly, or we add a frog, the frog, bee, fly, whatever constructor is automatically executed. If we don't see a constructor, it runs a what is called a default constructor. The default constructor just creates the object in the world. So here we see um, method has a um, another method within the body, and that is super. It calls the parent class, which is world, and the parent constructor requires three parameters. One is the width, one is the height, and one is the resolution. Now, you may wonder, how do we know this? Well, we can figure that out looking at the at world. And then we can go to the constructor for world. And we see world takes the width of the world, the height of the world, and the cell size of the world. Um, but that's how we know when it's saying super. Use the world constructor and use these parameters. So we see that over here. Um, let's move on a little bit. Constructors define the instance's size and resolution. This is not correct. It is correct in this instance, how we're using it, but it may not be correct every time you use a constructor. Later, we'll create our own constructors and we'll see that. In this case, though, the world constructor defines the instance's size and resolution. Constructors have no return type. That is always true. Um, constructors have the same name of the class. For example, a world constructor is named as world or my um, frog world constructor is going to be named frog world. So we see that. Um, let's jump back here. A constructor is a special kind of method that is automatically executed when a new instance of the class is created. So let's see how we can use that. Um, when we use, they're using B world, we go ahead and we um, call the super classes constructor and we send three parameters for the width, the height, and the resolution. I want to add a frog and I want to add a fly. So what I'm going to do is add the add object. I don't have a B. So, there we go. So notice every time I reset, they go back. Um, one thing that I may want to do, and I'm not going to do it right now, um, but I could use random numbers for the locations, and as long as I stay within my 600 or 400 number, we'll say up to 580 plus 10. And I'll explain why I'm doing that in a minute. 
There we go. So it did that. Um, if you don't understand why I did the plus 10 and minus 10, I don't want my fly to land or be inserted at the edge. So what I do is I say 580, which is 20 less than my 600. If I get 0, my x will be 10. If I get 580, then my x is 590. And it keeps that fly's x coordinates off of the left and right edge. And then I do the same. Notice the max is 400, so I use 380 plus 10 to give me 10 away from the y maximum and minimum. So let's come back to here and see what else they have. Um, actually, let's take a quick look. The add object, right? That is in the world, so we don't, it's in world, so we can look up um, world and we can see. Add object and notice add object requires an actor, an int x, and an int y. We see add object requires three parameters, which is what we have, right? Um, we're going to look at this code. Add object, one parameter, two parameters, three parameters. The new means we're creating the b, um, so we can't just put the b in there. If the b existed beforehand, then we can insert them in there. And we'll see that in one of the final slides of an alternate way to do it. Um, for now, we're going to leave it and just accept it as it is. Um, but we'll see another way that we can have done that. Um, we're actually combining two statements. Um, so let's look again here. Bring this full screen for you. Add object method is a world class method that adds a new object to the world at a specific x and y coordinate. Um, it includes a keyword to tell the green foot to create the new object, the method parameters, named object from actor class, the integer x, and the integer y. Um, and we see the definition. This is what we saw in the documentation. Void, add object. The actor object, which um, I'm using frog and fly, and then those coordinates. The new keyword. Um, so we, we added that in there. Um, the new keyword creates new instances of existing classes. It starts with the keyword new followed by the constructor to the call. So I could use new fly, new frog. Um, and remember I said if we don't see a constructor in the frog or fly, then it's using a default one that only creates the object and nothing else. The parameter list passes arguments and values to the constructor that are needed to initialize the object's instance variables. In this case, we don't have any um, parameters. But we did see for the world in super, it did have parameters. The default constructor has an empty parameter list and sets the object's instance variables to their default values. Um, that is always the case with the default constructor. Um, and then there would be default values for the instances. We don't always use the we don't always have to use the default constructor um, if there is a another constructor available. Um, we see with world we're using the world's constructor rather than a default constructor. I think at this point you should be familiar with the coordinate system, but just in case um, we start at zero zero, y works up, x works up. So here they're showing us adding the objects using the world constructor, and um, I already did that, so we don't need to worry about doing it again. Um, but you can do this if you like. Make sure you're updating um, the project for this um, assignment. And here we're adding an object, a new B. We give it its coordinates. Um, that would be in a B world world. Now, they show us another way, save the world. Um, and they give the steps. I'm just going to show that. Um, let's bring this full. So say I wanted a second fly here, new fly. And I right-click, save the world. It is not working. 
Save the world is not working for me right now. Um, it should work. Um, it's worked for me in the past. Sometimes it seems to work. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, we're not going to worry it, about it. Um, what should happen, we will see in the slides. I don't always use this anyhow. Air screenshot of what happens if you use Save the World. In this case, we can tell by what they've done. Um, they've added a bunch of bees and flies, or a bee and a bunch of flies. And then what happens is, you see, it creates a new method in the world called prepare. It would have put prepare under super. Um, and then the prepare method is going to create instances of the actor and then add them to the world. Notice it's slightly different than the way we did it. Um, it creates the object B. Right, it's a member of the B class, and it's going to the variable for that B will be B, and it's going to make a new B, and it will add it as B two ninety eight one seventy six. This is what we saw in the add object, um, the add object method that was listed in the world class, and then it does the same thing with fly. But notice it created a fly, then it created a second fly. And instead of that fly being named fly, we can only have one fly, otherwise we wouldn't be able to reference it. Um, this fly is going to be called fly2, and then this one will be fly3. And then we could say fly move, fly2 dot move, fly3 dot move, and there would be dot notation, we don't see it here, um, and a way to reference those. Um, I generally don't do it this way, I do it the way that we've seen manually adding. I will show why at the end for those who are curious to see. Um, but we see two ways and if the save world's not working, you have to do it the way um, the manually just add separate add object. So next thing we have is the terminology. So we're just going to review what we've learned. We saw comparison operators greater than, equal, less than, um, less than, equal, greater than, equal, not equal, same stuff we've seen in math. Constructor, constructor is a method that's named the same as the class, and it basically gives all the setup information for any instance that we create. Dot notation is going to give a path to where a method can be found. It will also be used to identify a specific instance of a class. New keyword creates a new instance of a class. The summary, um, we should have learned how to create randomized behaviors, define comparison operators, create a false control statements, create an instance of a class, recognize and describe dot notation, and use the save world feature, which didn't work in this case. I apologize for that. Um, so we're kind of done, but um, I will show you why I, an alternative, um, when you're creating multiple instances, what we can do is, and no, notice when I tried it, created my prepare. Um, I could put everything down and prepare. Maybe we'll do that just so we keep things neat, right? Um, that's what we try to do with some of these, um, creating our own methods. So at this point, um, I created the method prepare, or Greenfoot did, and I'm calling prepare. But say we want multiple flies. I've already have it set up to create random, randomly located flies. So what I could do is use a for loop, which we haven't learned yet. If you don't want to learn it, then you can turn off. But for int i equals one. This is just standard notation. I'm creating, I don't know why that popped up. This is just standard notation. Um, I'm creating a variable called i, and I'm going to set the i to one. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say, if i is less than, actually let's set i to five, zero. If i is less than five, Right, so from zero to four, what I want to do is add one to i. 
Now while this is running, it will go through any statements which is in this block. We'll add the block here. And I'm going to put this in inside that block. I think we learned this in Unit 10. Um, doesn't really matter if I have that spaced out or not. But so, again, for int i equals 0, as long as i is less than 5, we'll keep incrementing or adding 1 to i. So the first time through, i is 0, and it will run this statement. The second time through, i is now 0 plus 1, which becomes 1, and we'll run it again. And then it's zero, 1 plus 1, which is 2, 2 plus 2 is, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, 4 plus 1 is 5, well if it's 5 is not less than 5, it won't run this, it will now add the frog. So we'll take a look at that. Notice 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, so you see how it works. Um, at this point, we really are done. Um, so let me know if you have any questions. Hopefully, having this explained will be a little bit better for you.